Good afternoon. My name is Namdi Ele. I'm the head of School of Architecture and Planning. Um, welcome to the annual end of year school event and to our partner, um, Coric, and to the exhibition of the year. Um, before I continue, I would also like to welcome Mr. Nick Booth, the CEO of Coro Brick, and his colleagues who are generous to sponsor this program, as well as um, my colleagues in particular, Hilton Juden, Ariane Van Rensburg, uh, Gat Klein, Alison Todis, and um, Garrett Gantner, uh, Ludwig also for uh, heading the school and leading the program to this end. As we all know, this is the school's first major online. We always did it in person. When the shutdown happened, we didn't know how we would begin and how we would proceed, but we managed. And here we are in a medium that we did not anticipate. I want to thank all my colleagues in the architecture program, in the plan, in the planning program for being very dedicated and for bringing our students along. Above all, this evening is for the graduating Master of Architecture students. It is their show. They've shown enormous courage and resilience in the midst of a global challenge that we are all yet to fully digest. So I want to thank them for the courage and for being in on this platform. A few things to mention. I would like to mention that for those who are seeking professional development points, there would be um, a phrase that which is projected on the screen um, for you to use as a link in order to claim your points. Next, in following what we are going through, um, I would like all of us to welcome our colleague, um, the head of the uh, Campus Innovation Laboratory, who initiated its founding, um, senior lecturer, uh, and the uh, urban designer practitioner, um, Mr. Ludwig Hansen. He will be presenting a lecture on a crisis to accelerate current trends. I read that this should never be wasted. Without much ado, I would like to hand over to you, Ludwig. Please, I know that we are not in the best forum to work to do give an applause, but in whichever way we can, Ludwig, we are applauding you. Welcome. Over. Thanks very much, uh, Namdi, um, for those kind introductions. I'm just trying to set up. Everyone can see the screen, I trust. Can see it, yes. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Namdis, uh, thank you for the, um, for the kind introduction. Um, colleagues, um, guests, and dear students, and especially the Masters of Architecture students who are graduating uh, this year um, and who have sort of completed a very long journey under some very strenuous circumstances. Um, welcome to you and I trust that uh, whatever follows will be insightful and fruitful. I've been asked to offer some insights and observations to the students um, into what um, is a completely changed environment. Uh, from the one we started off with in 2020. 
The talk I've broken into uh, three distinct sections, uh, all related in some way or another to the changing environment we find ourselves. Um, the first is a brief introduction of the Campus Innovation Laboratory, also referred to as CIL, uh, which will start operating officially from 2021 as a sort of multi-layered platform for people across the uh, built environment faculty, faculty at WITS and the School of Architecture and planning to engage and participate in the development of their own environment, uh, in this case, the university campus. The second segment is probably more anecdotal um, rather than overtly scientific on the impressions of the changing city and architectural realities brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. The cursory reflection is built on a position that our cities and architecture will not fundamentally change, but that trends might and would be accelerated rather. The third component is a more self-conscious reflection of principles that has guided my own professional career uh, and that of my practice in addressing challenges and projects over the last couple of decades. Um, I will rather speak in terms of guiding principles rather uh, than projects or uh, tr traditional project, project by project description. And the aim is to create a, sort of a matrix of interrelated themes, which over time have evolved and I hope into a palpable manifesto. And I hope and trust that these would also assist the newly qualified architects in their path going forward. Uh, <coughs> starting with the Campus um, Innovation Laboratory, it is an idea which started more than two years ago based on WITS's involvement in the development of the two new universities of Sol Plaiki and the University of Mpumalanga. Uh, and the aim, the, the, the aim was to establish the Centre of Excellence that concentrates its research on the spatial development and development frameworks of university campuses and supports them in their efforts to grow the institutional infrastructure. And it would have three main functions. Firstly, uh, the CRL will be based at the School of Architecture and Planning uh, at WITS and in collaboration, in collaboration rather with a number of stakeholders. It would be the repository, the custodian and advisory unit uh, in relation to the WITS uh, spatial framework and the development of infrastructure on, the, on its campus. It has already initiated a series of workshops and discussion forums with architects and the respective academic end users and implementation units at WITS. Too often, the development of buildings uh, on, on campuses evolved in isolation or even in secret. Uh, and the School of Architecture and Planning should be a natural home for these discussions and coordinate the special future of the university. Only yesterday we had a further work session on a new series of buildings to be developed on the various campuses and included participants like Kate Otten, Peti Morogeli, Activate, Nabil Essa and many more who really share in, an interest in the, our campus together with academics and the like. The purpose of these sessions is to offer transparent oversight and greater input on projects, which I believe will result in an improved architecture and campus framework. Uh, the CIL also becomes the custodian uh, and is responsible for the continuous update of the framework, um, which over the last 20 years was mostly based in external architectural and urban design practices, very much like my own. We have transferred this wealth of information regarding the uh, WITS's uh, the data to a central archive for sharing with interested parties and stakeholders. We also hope to establish a ICT platform for sharing regarding development of the campus. Secondly, the CIL uh, will be a teaching and research and work experience laboratory for training postgraduate students in areas of expertise that are already being taught at the school. Fields of interest that can filter into this platform can vary from the obvious architectural and planning perspectives, but could also involve uh, in heritage landscaping and sustainability interests. The vast <coughs> experience and information already gathered um, in the development of university campuses over the last 15 years also allows the CIL to act as an advisory, not only to WITS, but also the other 25 universities in South Africa and beyond. Most universities in South Africa do not have the capacity to properly oversee their own vast infrastructure and architectural design requirements, nor do they have the ability to align academic needs, strategic spatial planning directives, 
nor address environmental challenges or appropriately attend to their own heritage, heritage custodianship. The third function of CIL is to enlarge and grow the already expanding archive related to university campuses. Over the last couple of years, I've recorded, surveyed and assisted all 26 institutions uh, or universities in South Africa, making the CIL the custodian of the most complete university database in South Africa. WITS has also been, at a large, to a large degree, responsible for the development of those two new universities, as mentioned earlier. And this process of establishment uh, is an extensive source of information for research purposes, which should celebrate the WITS's key involvement in the development of these uh, two universities. A possible fourth purpose of the unit is to ensure a third stream income for the school by offering these advisory services to WITS and other institutions. The CRL is thus completely self-funded and hopes to generate substantial means to support other initiatives, initiatives in the School of Architecture and Planning. We are currently ex uh, expanding or linking to the uh, school's website and information regarding possible participation, etc. will ob obviously uh, be welcomed. The second segment of the talk, and something Namdi wanted me specifically to address, uh, is impressions on the impact of COVID-19 on our built environment. It also addresses indirectly the experiences of the lockdown students have experienced and submitted as written documentation, which CRL is sponsoring. Over the last now nine months, um, the COVID-19 pandemic as a fundamentally social and so societal event impacted devastatingly on individuals, households, and our communities. Most visibly, the lockdown has resulted in staggering levels of hunger as households' um, income uh, collapsed, nutrition, uh, access to nutrition became increasingly difficult. Other social impacts such as uh, job losses, uh, interruptions to public health programs, uh, loss of access to educational and other child support services, uh, growing challenges with mental health, and increased gender-based violence are collectively deepening destitution and in many, uh, in many of our communities. We saw images of and all experienced ourselves gathering outside the windows of seniors, li li senior living facilities, where parents and grandparents were dying in record numbers. People were forced to stand unprotected from the elements, putting their hands to windows above them, seeking communication with people on the other side of aluminium sidings. This anecdotal experience might just be a small example of the greater societal tragedies. tragedies. But it did mark architectural failure and a real-time example of how people will spontaneously repurpose buildings if those buildings aren't serving them well. In cities around the world, people eyed each other warily over face masks, moving to the edge of sidewalks, hugging the entryways to buildings, letting the elevator pass rather than join other passengers in confined space. As urbanists, I, as, as an urbanist, I've always professed that our cities need to be denser and better connected if we were to avoid the environmental problems and the mid-century suburban car-based culture. Taller buildings, greater in grand variety, help increase, <coughs> help increase density. But urban life must also be full of interactions and so social energy if we are to live happily in proximity. Social stability across the generations require that we live in fluid, multi-generational communities, integrated rather than isolating or alienating the young, the working age, uh, and the elderly. Yet, COVID-19 has threatened all of us, not just, not just high-minded ideas about dense, social, diverse, democratically uh, engaged cities, but also the way we inhabit our buildings and move through space were suddenly threatened. Meanwhile, hundreds of millions of people, including many architects, were confronting the inadequacies of their own domestic spaces overcrowded shelters, homes and informal structures, placed within unserviced and congested informal settlements, small apartments, um, clustered around empty event spaces, and workrooms that weren't safe for use. Open planned suburban houses with vast interiors lacked sufficient partitions to keep people with the virus apart from those within. As weeks of 
isolations turned to months, and as the fear of a rise of infections grew, these inadequacies seemed to forge a new consensus, not fully articulated, but widely felt. Our picture is about rights, about air, about equal access to the necessities of life. Underlying question repeatedly then discussed, is COVID going to change our cities and then our architecture? In addressing these sort of heady topics, I would suggest a wider historic perspective and the investigation of similar catastrophic events in our society. The Black Death traveled from Asia to Europe during the mid 14th century, leaving devastation in many cities. The plague changed the course of Europe history. With so many dead, labor became harder to find, bringing about better play for workers, largely resulting in the end of serfdom. Studies have also pointed to the steep improved living conditions, access to better nutrition, as well as the development of a large number of new technological innovations due to the lack of cheap labor. The London fire equally resulted in building codes that led to timber, led timber constructed buildings to be replaced by fireproof brick constructions. Uh, thus, the crisis did not result in change. Uh, it has merely hastened, accelerated trends of change that were already apparent before the crisis of the pandemic or the fire in this case. Similar health outbreaks of cholera in the 19th century Europe resulted in the implementation of vast modern sanitation projects, the introduction of more public spaces and parks. In, recent, uh, in a recent interview, Norman Foster went so far to suggest that the health crisis of the early 20th century, uh, tuberculosis and the flu pandemic, which also struck South Africa very hard, resulted in the birth of, modern, of the modern movement in architecture. Big windows, sunlight, terraces, uh, whitewashed walls, clean and utilitarian buildings. All of these consequences of, of these disasters, fireproof construction methodologies, sewer, sanitation and fresh water accessibility, more green parks, even rationalized clinical architecture could in all likelihood have happened anyway. But the crises hastened and magnified their introduction. Following the same logic, the coronavirus pandemic could speed up the adoption of a number of initiatives that have struggled for recognition or adoption by government organizations, commercial interests and the broader public. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis, instead of bringing change of unknown proportions, will rather hasten, accelerate trends of change that were already apparent before the pandemic in 2020. The most obvious example is the sudden conversion of many academic programs to online formats that enable the sort of gatherings we share tonight. These technologies have been available for some time, but were only adopted as the new norm due to the pandemic. As architects, we should be emboldened by the growing realization that this is a transformational moment that could topple old hierarchies. It could be in the mold of the modernism of old with its promise to remake the world. The question then must arise, what trends of, trends of change are we as architects and planners going to demand or enact? I would like to raise some aspects of condensed change which we as architects and planners need to consider. Firstly, the coronavirus pandemic could and should speed up the adoption of more sustainable buildings and city environments. We now have, we now have uh, ample scientific evidence to prove that green buildings, um, apart from being more sustainable for our environment uh, with natural ventilations, are not only good for our health, but they also enable us to perform better. These kinds of buildings are now still the exception at the fringe of architectural design, impacting most developments in smaller portions or doses, and in many cases as superficial acknowledgement for commercial purposes. But the COVID pandemic will force the inevitable adoption of sustainable principles in architecture in a, in a more shortened period, and they could become mainstream much quicker. The sudden dependencies on local resources, manufacturing and skills, together with the demand for quality air, open spaces and integration with natural systems, will more rapidly become the norm rather than the exception. Our increasing drive towards greater densification of our cities should also accelerate the importance of greater shared green spaces, uh, however big or small. 
uh, studies have clearly shown that they contribute to better health and well-being. I, I always enjoy the met metaphor that, that equates a building or an urban space to a living organism, as it allows us to perceive it differently with a deeper sense of humans, hum humanism. Um, buildings and cities breathe, excrete, and circulate air and fluids, but they also think and perhaps feel. Buildings, neighborhoods, and cities, and the natural landscape into which we insert them have rights, and those rights must be negotiated. The pandemic has hastened the view that architecture will not continue to exist by itself. It will have to integrate itself with other things. And the discipline has to realize that the isolation from life, from social knowledge and discourse, has harmed it. A second major change will be in mobility, movement and accessibility. Access to all needs and requirements within walking distance. The introduction of more community-based servicing will make the demands for massive road infrastructure questionable. For transport, current trends towards electric vehicles will continue as well as a rise in use of e-bikes and scooters while charging on the move could be introduced and public transport systems reconfigured. Car dependencies would result in the car parking requirements becoming near uh, obsolete or our expansive spending on motor oriented infrastructure questioned and repurposed for far more place relevant community requirements. By the same token, big centralized service providers and retailers have been bemoaned as the bane of our high streets and diverse urban drain. These are now under threat of becoming obsolete as well, and many of them will have to be repurposed. A third condensed change will revolve around urban farming, which could make a return to city cities as one uh, uh, on several ways. Um, that the area urban areas would become far more greener. The expansion of the pro productive landscape into our underutilized, sprawled, and inefficient cities should be on all community and local government agendas. The coronavirus pandemic is threatening food shortages due to supply chain disruptions and labor shortage. The seeds of enthusiasm for home or locally grown fruits may have been sown. The conversions of large underutilized parking spaces are becoming the norm, but sustaining these is essential. Urban farming has much to offer in the wake of the pandemic. It could help communities boost the resilience of their fresh fruit and vegetable supplies, improve the health of residents, and help them lead more sustainable lifestyles. The fourth aspect is the development of a more robust architectural typology, or typologies rather. The only certainty about the future is its uncertainty. Architectural robustness and flexibility is key. This implies that architecture, which is traditionally fixed in its functional program, program cannot accommodate the, far, uh, the very fast evolving technologies around it. Exam examples of this we find in the health sector, where the science fast outpaces or outruns the space it needs to, to be accommodated in. The same applies to teaching spaces and commercial buildings. Thus, the future architecture will in broad terms follow the following mandate. Be maximizingly open and flexible in space offering, but highly serviced to accommodate technology um, and uh, lifestyle improvements. <clears throat> the last consequence which I like to raise is the accelerated uh, is the accelerated spatial in inequalities due to the pandemic. If the logic I'm proposing that the pandemic hastens the already is unfortunately also true when re reflecting on inequalities in our society. All of the above positives around sustainability, mobility, and food security will cause the desired improvements, of course, but will not matter if we do not address our increasing societal inequalities. The pandemic has painfully highlighted the inequalities in the urban infrastructure, the lack of basic services at schools and in residential areas, and in overcrowding and informal settlements. I spoke earlier of changes brought about in the 19th century pandemics, these are sadly not available um, at, uh, at, in large proportions of our sh shared society. And I fear that the pandemic, with, which on the one hand speeds up change, will also widen the gulf and disparity in our society. We understand that our South African urban environments, as in the case with most African cities, is fraught with tensions and disjunctions. 
place, places that require broader in-depth understanding of its inner workings. The COVID pandemic has highlighted these tensions even further, and we believe that our cities are, pl are places of hope for millions of urban migrants who view the city as, as a great opportunity to exchange with others has become an unattainable dream. The COVID pandemic, I fear, if we do not address these inadequacies or inequalities, will increase the violent contest between extreme wealth and extreme poverty, between luxury and subsistence, between excess and need. This enormity and demand for change in our living conditions of so many of our urban citizens creates the impression that we don't know where to start. I believe that the best way forward as, uh, as spatial practitioners is to, is to is continued exchange as we grow to learn chiefly through contact with others. Successive and sustained exchange with the community helps to remove tensions and stress of isolation, enabling greater avenues that otherwise would have stayed impossible. But in closing on this section, I'm confident that the cities will prove their res resilience as it's always done. And they will bounce back strong and better as a consequence. Uh, as mentioned in the, in the introduction, the third component is a more self-conscious reflection of principles that has guided my own professional career and that of my practice in addressing challenges and projects over the last couple of decades. Relooking and uh, contemplating one's work, body work is a very self-conscious act, but also necessary self-critique and reflection realizing that one has been fortunate to have worked with so many able and engaging people. Instead of projects, uh, I want to highlight methodologies of design and guiding principles which create a matrix of interrelated themes, which I also hope give the qualifying students uh, some pointers of embarking on their own professional career. The principle, principles are in some way an expansion on the discourse we had during the 14-part lecture series during the second semester at WITS. I've collated key pers um, personal architectural principles under six broad headings, which include the position of being an urbanist and the essence of context, um, the fundamental, fund fund fundamental aspect of collaboration, the importance of the narrative and creating a sense of meaning in our architecture, the value of making, assembly and craftsmanship, uh, the significance of placemaking and the aim to establish place-bound, place-relevant spatial interventions, uh, the urgency of sustainability of greater socio and -envi environmental consciousness, and the value of seeing, seeing design as a broad ability, which implies we not become selective of projects. Not being able to cover all of these principles, I've selected three or four to briefly share by way of some projects I've completed over the years. The first topic is the understanding that all our interventions occur or impact on the existing context, in our case mostly an urban one. We approach design from a very urbanist perspective, which is a key driver in our approach towards design of our architecture and the built environment. By professing an urbanist position, it does not apply a, a specific urban philosophy, but rather an approach which relies on a conscious reading and interpreting of the environment within which our design designs are located. Uh, we've, we've lost touch with the public's understanding of what the built environment is supposed to do. These questions were kind of academic, but now with COVID, they have brought about or brought into sharp relief and are present in everyday's life. And we all have come to realize that our built environment is, could be a threat to us. Our architecture needs to radically change towards a service profession, working not in isolation, but across disciplinary boundaries, approaching projects not just as problems to be solved by steel, concrete, and glass, but as social problems and needs that demand wider, more holistic solutions. Underpinning the urbanist approach, the design is the importance of collaboration, collaboration with colleagues, stakeholders, end users, uh, and varying client bodies has been key, key to the successful completion of projects of varying scale and influence. The process of architecture, <coughs> the process of architecture, and even more so when we attempt to build and improve our cities today, has become so institutionalized, technical and specialized 
that people seldom have an outlet to put their intuitions to, to use. It is pertinent in our thinking that we find avenues during which our design process can integrate people. We found over the years that sustained connections and continued conversations with participants results in better design solutions. So, so I think these are reflected also um, in an equitable participative process among a broader audience. It creates a fantastic sense of ownership for all involved in the implementation of the architecture. This not only involves sharing of the architecture and planning process, but also in the creation and making of the architecture. And the most in, um, endearing of these programs is the artworks programs that we've introduced in most of our projects, where co community and end use make a beautiful and contribute to a beautiful final product. The notion of place and collaboration also speaks to resources and skill sets in, in different environments. R rural sites may have workforce is made up of people unemployed and unskilled into the construction process, which asks us as from an architecture for an architecture that can teach and simplifies the documentation assembly process. The very same sites also present master builders with an unrivaled knowledge and building experience in the local environment and materials. Architect designs the means towards greater participation, becomes a scholar, ensuring that the architecture becomes a better expression of that place and its people. Allowing or rather creating uh, multiple avenues of involvement involves also improves the resultant architecture by adding a further personal dimension not possible by the architect or designer on its own. A second principle in our work speaks to the importance of the narrative and the ability to draw as an essential architectural language. Architecture ought to ought to, ought to have an underlying narrative that embodies the sense of space, makes it exper experiential and meaningful. The, the psychological dimension of architecture is addressed by, by spatial narrative and the making the design approach more humanistic. In our office, sketching and drawing is a fun, fundamental narrative tool and a key component of our design methodology. Sketching and drawing are an indispensable means of communication between designers, end users, contractors and the like and an intrinsic link to, the, to every, every project narrative. Proficiency at drawing and using it as a medium of communication plays a particularly important role in our work with the freehand drawing as a tool of self-correcting the whole design process, especially in an age of computerized processing. Our architectural projects, exhibition, landscape design and urban interventions all stem from original ideas put down on paper. Sketches and drawing clearly ensure us full freedom to explore our emerging ideas and images, acting as a reference until the project is implemented. Nowadays, when thinking about art, it seems that it's dominated by computer software and the architect's hands no longer interferes in the design stage between vision and created reality. The same holds true uh, with, with model building as key component in the design development of projects and small. Powerful to verify the spatial three-dimensional structures and allow simulation, analysis and validation. Increasingly, the making of models establishes the bridge to the third principle, which is the importance allotted to assembly and crafting of our places and architecture. We understand craftsmanship not just as the simple act of making, but that, that craftsmanship embodies a much broader concept that involves going beyond industrialization and developing an understanding of tools and materials as precious resources to be carefully employed rather than exploited. The value of the master builders, again, a reminder that we cannot ignore the relationship between uh, materials and the origins in nature during the production process. The dependencies on utilizing and expanding the local abilities the consideration of renewable, na uh, renewable nature is a key aspect of craftsmanship in our design and we eventually in the making of our, of our project. The material selections of any building is key to the architectural palette as it renders a tangible expression of its place and its people. As an example, many of the projects from our office, for example, have adopted brickwood as a celebrated building, uh, building element. The brick building has the ability to re reveal much about a project and its emanation. The color of the brick, re brick reveals the geology of the place and the quality of the kilns and, and whether they are sourced locally. A brick structure is honest to scale 
It has the ability to reveal a building's program and con considerations around local climate. Understanding a selected material's limitation and abilities is synonymous with craft, craft and assembly. The same applies to our selections of use of timber, prefabrication and off shutter concrete. A crafted production of buildings plays a key role towards architectural space making. Both craftsmanship and architectural design re rely heavily on tacit forms of knowledge, skills and experience in addition to communicable knowledge. We, where we transfer knowledge from the architect to the craftsperson people as a crucial aspect of implementation. Underlying the, our design methodologies are two also underlink, uh, interlinked themes. An architecture and design that is place appropriate or place bound, and the importance of place and space making. Starting on the larger or, or urban scale, the importance of shared space cannot be overstated. Neither its ability to enable its citizens to achieve their own goals and dreams. I'm of the opinion that the public realm in our cities and the spaces our architecture respond to has two primary roles. Firstly, it is the dwelling place of our civic life. And secondly, is the physical manifestation of the common good. When we degrade the public realm, we automatically degrade the quality of our civic society. So what makes good civic or public architecture? What ensures a sense of place? I believe, I believe it's primarily dependent on our ability as architects and planners to define space by applying the vocabulary, syntaxes, rhythms, and patterns of architecture. It's our job as architects and planners to, to do take on this responsibility. I, I'm of the opinion that uh, we as architects have consciously removed ourselves from the public edge, and if the long-term sustainability of our cities are to be ensured our spatial principles have to change dramatically. This aim to create also memorable space, a sense of place, uh, a place worth caring for is so important because it not only informs us where we are geographically, but also un under underlines where we are in our culture, where we come from and what kind of people we are. And it affords us a glimpse as to where we are going, and most importantly, I think it allows us to dwell in a very hopeful present. The last it's principle right. I would like to share, especially to those students that are embarking on their professional career, speaks to the potential of design, the ability of design solutions to be applied as broad as possible. And we, as architects, should not become selective of the type of work that we apply our skills to, especially, especially um, with the great unknowns going forward. The act of designing in architecture is a complex process. As professionals, we have a natural inclination to specialize our, uh, our expertise in order to become highly proficient, um, which also then further ensures uh, work and sustains us financially. This increasing specialization in selected fields of architecture or design eventually results in a routine application um, of a sort of known set of design steps. This in turn creates familiarity, a sense of comfort, which then risks, runs the risk of becoming complacent. In our work, I'm adamant that we tackle challenges across scales, from intimate items of urban furniture to urban design projects on a regional planning scale. Our spatial comprehension lends us inherent ability to understand scale, ergonomics, and proportion. It, in a time where project, project ideologies are driven largely by clients' uh, priorities, see resilience and profitability, profitability. Designing for the body remains for us what we think is the most important part, designing for humans. It allows us to be inventive. We are in a unique position as not, and, not, and not think these elements as traditional separate but joined together. We involve ourselves in new homes or complete additions. It excites us to be part of a process where we built for our clients and their characters. We enjoy the deeply personal relationships and unique quality to each building shares. We've designed public buildings as we strive to create safe and equitable public spaces around civic services. It allows us to learn from the dynamic informal ecology and the way large groups of people use spaces, rather bringing them together. We all we involve ourselves in service callings, but at mo as most environments need services to function, 
rather than treating power plants and pump rooms as back of house type, which actually we see it as opportunities to celebrate and articulate utilitarian buildings. We design institutional buildings as we enjoy the challenge of being able to demonstrate the ability to translate institutional values, core beliefs and, and ambitions, spatial requirements. We design spatial frameworks as we respect and value context and its associated cultures and identities, as well as the values of land and its limit and in, as an infinite resource. It, it allows us to propose frameworks that are place bound and firmly integrated communities. Our office has and will continue design as broadly as possible as it allows us to identify opportunities and to be inventive. It allows us hopeful, hopefully to remain relevant and to continuously work towards becoming proficient designers of space. Underlying all of this work is that our projects are shared experiences by a whole host of people and based on the input from multiple stakeholders, partners and friends over the last more than now 20 years. And as a concluding remark, I'd like to thank all of those who have, I've had the honor of working and collaborating with, and I trust there will be many more of these. Also, a special thanks to people in my office, to Jessica Thompson for assisting with the assembly of the talk, and thank you to the school for allowing me to address you, and wishing all of you a well-deserved break and an exciting start to 2021. Thanks, Nambi. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ludwig, for the detailed lecture, for reviewing the contributions of uh, Campus Innovation Lab uh, and the possibilities it holds, and for sharing the uh, consequences and the ways that the um, pandemic is uh, encouraging us to uh, innovate and uh, move forward. And um, in this case, um, the conscientious, street-minded, African urban spaces-minded, uh, urban design that you've shared, all that are very much uh, appreciated. And in this case, we would like to again thank you very much we would like to go to the third item on our agenda by uh, introducing um mr nick booth the ceo of coral Brick, who is joining us this evening to announce the prize winners the partners with uh, the partnership with coral Brick is one that we greatly value and we acknowledge the support you have given the school and the students and the excellent work that you do in our built environment community. To the students, we would like to ask the students who have won prizes to switch on their cameras and say a word or two um, in acknowledgement. And uh, we congratulate you on your outstanding achievements. Um, I now welcome uh, Mr. Nick Booth, who would um, log in, and if he shows up under Nadine, please. Today is not April first. He's <laughs> the staff who is guiding and supporting the system. Um, now he is showing up as Mr. Nick Booth. Come on in. <laughs> welcome, Nambi. Thank you, Nambi. Thank you for those very kind words, and thank you for the privilege of joining you all this evening. Um, I'd like to thank the, the School of Architecture and Fits for putting this together in these very interesting and trying of times. It is actually at times like this and, and listening to Ludwig that we start to realize the importance of safety uh, in terms of our built environment and, and the way we operate. And I know in South Africa, we always talk about safety, but I think the pandemic has brought home Nick, your microphone is muted. I don't know where I got to until I was muted, but as I say, it's a privilege to be here this evening 
And, um, and I want to thank Namdi and the School of, of Architecture for putting this together. Uh, it's it's uh, difficult and trying times. I represent a, a, a building product that is synonymous, I think, with both steadfastness and safety in terms of the built environment. And it's also our steadfastness and our, our belief in, in the architectural um, profession that means that for the last 34 years we've been involved in the Student Architecture Awards, both on a regional and a national basis. That all being said, and not wanting to be long-winded and keep us away from the, the, some of the important things that are happening this evening, I'm very proud to announce, first of all, the winner of the Brick Prize. That is the person or the student who we believe has done the best uh, project uh, utilizing the product which we so proudly make. And the winner of the Big Prize and 6,000 Rand is Muketwa uh, Nebutanda. Uh, Muketwa, if you'd like to come online, my congratulations to you for winning the Big Prize. Hi, Booth. <laughs> Okay, Ketwa, you've also been uh, silenced, I'm afraid. Hi, Nick. Can you hear me? Yeah, much better. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I can't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a stunning project, and it really epitomizes the kind of work we believe that can be done with the product. Well done. Thank you so much, Nick, and thank you to uh, the Witt School of Architecture. Thank you. <laughs> that being said, Muketwe, if you'll stay in line, because I'm also very pleased to announce the winner of the third prize uh, for the in the overall awards is again Muketwe uh, Nebutanda. That's you again. So well done. With a further prize of 6,000 Rand. So you're having a very lucrative evening. <laughs> That shows you how good the project really is. Well done. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nick. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, and good luck with your, with your future endeavours and your choice of career. I think you're going to go far. Uh, that's, I'm very biased in terms of your project, obviously. But honestly, all the best. Congratulations. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. And I'd like to send a special thank you to my supervisor, uh, Sichawa Mape. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, we then move on from the third prize to the second prize overall. The winner of that is uh, Jonathan Mel uh, Melam Dawitz. I apologize if I pronounced that incorrectly. A toxic, uh, toxic Collectives of the Mining Territory. Jonathan, if you'd like to come on the phone. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Jonathan around? Hi, right, can you hear me? There we go. No, no, no. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, you're up. I think we have a bad connection. Technology is not our friend this evening, Jonathan, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think we've got a bad connection on this side. But yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So really, congratulations. And again, I think the. What, you, what you're trying to achieve with your project, um, and for what I could see, the little bit of it I could see and understand is around slime stands, etc. Unbelievable. I really hope that uh, it gains some traction. Uh, I think the environment we live in is the kind of project that, that uh, for future years is going to really deliver. So well done. Yeah, thank you so much. And then, uh, that being said, we now go on to the, the main prize winner, which is a prize of 10,000 Rand. And um, 
The name of the project is Hambani Gartley, reimagining Am Avalon Shepherd's Virtue as a space for social integration. And the winner is Mohammed Ta Mohammed. Mohammed, my congratulations. You're on the same connection. Oh my word, I hope this works. But well done. I mean, absolutely amazing. I know the Avalon 70, and I was absolutely blown away by this project. Well done. I think Mohammed's got the same problem. Jonathan, have a go. Let's see if you can manage to get a few words in. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks. It's a huge honor to have this prize. And thank you to my supervisors, to Carter Break, to my friends and family, and everyone who's had a part in this. Thanks. Thanks, Mohammed. <laughs> Before I hand back to the, the professor, I'd just like to say, um, and I hope this bodes well for the, for the three of you as well, but our track record in terms of prize winners and their future careers is absolutely outstanding. And, and many, and in fact, most of our prize winners have gone on to bigger and better things. So I hope this bodes well for all of your careers. And my absolute congratulations to you guys and to the School of Architecture at, at the University of Edwardstrom. I think you've, you've turned in some outstanding work. And to the supervisors, pat yourselves on the back. Well done, everybody. And thanks for the privilege of being with you this evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Nick. Thank you and congratulations, everyone. Um, this is really indeed an exciting space considering what uh, the environment is. Thank you again, colleagues. Um, the awards not only show your uh, dedication, but your resilience and the uh, hope that we can innovate. Thank you. And now we will go to the announcements of the um, COVID essay prize winners. Earlier this year, we, when the lockdown happened, we announced um, a call and inadvertently and without discussions, um, Ludwig touched on this. The contributors' essays challenge everything we have learned about space from diverse perspectives, but together they pose one crucial question. We may have found the vaccine, as the news suggests, or vaccines for coronavirus, more to come out, but we might, but what might we invent that could stop human beings from causing harm to their environment and to one another? In an inadvertent way, this somehow was one thing that Ludwig explained in his essay in terms of the environment, the 19th century, the mod advent of modern architecture to challenge lack of sanitation. A few essays stood out. But first, let me congratulate our colleagues who may or may not be here. Alison Todis, uh, Phil Harrison, Margot Rubin, Alexander, and uh, Alexander, who, um, whose essay, these are colleagues, staff, whose essays interrogate urban density and show that there is no ready-made answer. This is to some extent what Ludwig Hansen has interrogated in the presentation. The model of urban density that was presented in the mid 20th century is now contradicted by emerging global experiences and nation building projects in Southern Africa. Sally Gall, another colleague, essay and uh, shows soul penetrating photographs and reminds us about the ephemerality of everyday life. While Ms. Sandra Felix's piece is about teaching, learning, and finding solutions for the unknowns, regardless of how imperfect the answers may be. And I would say that Sandra's essay brings us to the point wherein the staff and the students have worked together on the imperfect answers to bring us to this point, wherein some students work 
have even excelled and have won awards. And that brings us to the students by the to the students essays. Alexander Mars essay proposes design solutions among experimental presentations by several students. Sihile Pasuria's essay brings all the propositions together. It exposes human beings as intelligent, creative, innovative, and social kinds. But she also exposes that human beings are violent and prone to alcoholism and the most dangerous species on earth. Yes, indeed, we are. Sihile's essay reminds us that there is no vaccine that could cure humanity of its fundamental failings. In this sense, while the attention to containing COVID-19 is real and necessary, scientists, political and social leaders are yet to address the threat that human humankind represents to itself and to the environment at large. What vaccine shall we encourage our scientists to invent in order to cure humanity of its fundamental violence and shortcomings against each other? With that, I would like to um, name the first prize, which goes to Alexander Ma, 2000 Rand. Alexander, would you please stand up and give a word or two, or come online? Hello, Prof. Ella. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for the award and for the opportunity in the original call for papers. Um, COVID presents an unprecedented opportunity for architecture to uh, rethink its applications and social value, as Ludwig Hansen suggested earlier, and the call for papers was a way to explore that. So um, thank you, Prof, and also to all the VIT staff involved in the essay logistics. Um, thanks. Thank you. Um, I would like to name the second prize of uh, to Kadi Bokshima, whose um, essay is exciting. It is an avant-garde piece that records, reports almost in a seasoned journalistic term of how the world was covering the COVID essay. It wasn't just this, it was the whole world. It captured it in totality. Please, um, um, Kadi Bokshima, would you please come online and accept the prize of 1,500 Rand? Hi there, everybody. Um, my thinking behind this piece was, well, I had actually written two different essays and one was academic, thought out, and the other one was just how I felt. <laughs> the other one was just spitting out everything that had come up. And that's that's the sense that I got from everyone I spoke to. Everybody didn't know which way to turn <laughs> or what was going on. And I felt that it perfectly captured the moment. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. And we welcome the third prize, Sihile. Pasurai, whose essay poses the basic human question because it exposes humanity. Here we are talking about COVID, but the essay reminds us that locking underneath, and it has always been there, it will continue to be there after we find vaccines for COVID, is the nature of humankind what do we do to attend to this nature that's a very um, critical interrogation on this note i welcome sehile pasurai to come online and accept the prize of 1000 rand
See, um, it appears Sihile may not be here with us or is not able to join us, but that will be conveyed. Um, the next are uh, a series of five equal prizes, which is um, what here it will be named not in order of uh, in just order, not in any preference above one another. Um, Sarita Pile and Miriam Maina's S joint essay, which is um, based on academic survey of the impact of, of the COVID in the immediate populations around Joburg area. Joshil Naran Yahoda, Sigo Nomondu Wabu Chido Nanzeman Hamo. We all congratulate you. Please, one at a time, might you come out and come online and accept the offer. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Chido, and I just wanted to say thank you very much for um, considering my essays. Um, and congratulations to all the other winners. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for the award. Uh, this is Namon de Gwebu. Um, thank you so much for acknowledging the piece and um, also for the the moment to just reflect that one may not have taken without the without the opportunity. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And any other winner present? Other winners. Um, I'd also just like to say thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, it was it was good also to have a chance to reflect. Thank you. Um, now we will um, go on to the opening of the exhibition, and I would like to um, indicate that the COVID essay prizes were sponsored by. Campus Innovation Laboratory. <laughs> 